And before we get into the architecture, let's look at some of the challenges. So the first challenge I want to talk about is Spanifis is built on top of commodity hardware. It's similar to your web scale systems, but it actually talks enterprise protocols. So if you look at the enterprise stack, it evolved around reliable hardware. You have things like RAID, where if a disk fails, you have a replacement disk. And the protocols that enterprises use, things like NFS and SMB, evolved around that hardware. SMB is stateful, and you have things like sessions. But on the other side, you have the cloud built using uh, commodity hardware that just scales out. But the protocols that the cloud uses is very different. Like you can ask Moed, and GFS does not talk POSIX semantics, and it's not similar to SMB or NFS. Our first challenge is to sort of merge these two stacks. You want commodity hardware scale out uh, architecture, but then it has to talk enterprise protocols, and it has to be compatible with all the other things that the enterprise use. And for this, we actually built all the protocols from ground up. Um, the NFS, even SMB, S3, we built them from scratch because we wanted it to have the same failure semantics. We wanted it to have the same uh, uh, consistency, and so on. So because of this, we can operate on commodity hardware. It can scale out, and it can talk the protocols that the enterprises are familiar with. The second challenge I want to talk about is consolidation of all the workloads. As Mohit mentioned, we can do several things. We can do archival, uh, data protection, and so on, um, NAS workloads, filer. If you look at these workloads, the characteristics are very different. Like some of it is sequential, some of it is random, and also the uh, latency requirements are different. It's all over the map. How do you support all these workloads? And we have to support them concurrently. Like we have to have all these workloads running together on the same system. So we handle this um, uh, with two different things. One is we have very fine-grained QS. I'll talk about that in a bit. So every workload um, has different QS settings. And the second uh, thing that we consider is that we take the media characteristics into account. So we know that um, SSDs are good for random writes, but for sequential writes, they are little better, but not uh, orders of magnitude. They are like 3x better, not 10x or 100x better. So we take these characteristics into account. Um, and when, the, when a stream comes in, we land them differently. So depending on the workload, um, it gets a different QoS, and also it, uh, it, it is processed differently. The data layout is also different depending on the workload. So let's look at SpanFS in a little more detail. So we talked about scale-out architecture, which means that nodes would be added or removed, and so on. And we have the cluster management, which takes care of that. All of our metadata is stored in a scale-out key value store. And again, this key value store was built uh, uh, custom built from scratch because we wanted it to have certain properties. We wanted it to be very strictly consistent, and we wanted it to have uh, 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 scalability for the file system. So all the metadata lives in this key value store. And it also runs on every single node. So when you add a node, you not only add CPU, you add memory, you add disk. You also add, like, the, the key value store service runs on every single node, and so you add more space for metadata. You add more space for data. So because of this, when you scale out the cluster, the space for metadata also scales out. We have a distributed lock manager, which... So, Ganesh, the, um, as the metadata is uh, spread across mm -hmm. all the nodes, is it sharded, or is it are the copies of all the same, or...? No, so the metadata is sharded. Uh, like every piece of metadata at least lives in two or more nodes. Yeah. So it, it's a key value store, and every key sort of lives and in multiple. Every node doesn't have all the data. It's sharded. So we have the distributed lock manager, which arbitrates access in the cluster. Um, any shared resource in the cluster um, needs a distributed lock, and that's handled by the distributed lock manager. Then we have SnapTree, which is a B plus tree that's built on top of the key value store. So this is a, a, a scalable B plus tree architecture. And every file or 
uh, every volume, which we call as view, anything can be cloned instantly in a few milliseconds, and that's enabled by the snap tree. We talked about all the metadata living in a key value store, but if you look at some um, inode operations, such as creating a file, two inodes are involved. Like the file that is being created, it needs a new inode, and the directory inode is modified to point to the file. If there is a crash or uh, something happens in the middle, you don't want a dangling inode. You don't want the file inode to be created, but then no directory is pointing to it, or worse, a directory is pointing to an inode which doesn't exist. So to avoid things like this, we actually built a transaction layer on top of the key value store. Even though it's distributed, we have a transaction mechanism, and this is the layer that manages all of the inodes. Then we have the data repository that manages all the disks in the system. Um, it, it manages all the storage, whether it's disks or SSD, and this optimizes the writes. For sequential, it optimizes the sequential writes. For random, uh, it uses SSD. We also have a distributed data journal. For random writes, as well as writes which require low latency, we, uh, if we take it through all our stack, it may take some time. So for that, we have a distributed journal. When a write comes in, it'll write to the local SSD, it'll write to a remote SSD, and then it'll acknowledge the write. Because of this, we can provide low latency writes. So all this is tied together in the Coacity SpanFS, and we have implemented the protocols on top of the SpanFS. Again, uh, if you look at the last box, it's Data Protect, which is our data protection software suite, which again runs on every single node. Every single service in our uh, cluster is distributed. So we talked about metadata being spread throughout the cluster, and now we might have to do some things which require global view of the system. Things like uh, garbage collection in a deduplicated file system, we need to make sure that no file is referring to this block before we garbage collect it. So that's done by the healer. It runs a map reduce just for the metadata, and it gets a global view of the system and then it can perform operations on it. The healer is also responsible for things like, let's say there is a disk failure. It figures out where the data has to go from that disk, and then uh, it, it redistributes the data that was lost or um, from the other copy, and so on. The other thing I want to talk about is QoS. Every single I.O. that comes in is stacked with the QoS, depending on uh, the policy, like view, you can set a policy, I'm using this for backup, or I'm using this for test and dev, or I'm using this for filer. And based on that, every single I.O. is tagged. And we also tag the I.O. based on whether it's part of a sequential stream or a random stream. Now, the QS does two things. First, it determines the priority with respect to other I.O.s in the system. And before accessing any shared resource, be it a disk, or be it the metadata server, or be it something else, it goes through a QS queue. And the priority determines uh, which I.O. goes first. The other thing the QS does is it figures out where to land the data. Like if it's a sequential stream, then it might just land the data into the hard disk, because it might be part of a backup where it keeps large number of I.O.s outstanding. But if it's, if, if it's part of a workload that needs low latency writes, then it lands the data into SSD directly. So all this is part of a single cluster, and then it can talk to other QCD clusters via replication. It can archive to the cloud, and it can also tier the cold data into the cloud. So we talked about uh, global space efficiency and QS. Now let's look at instant mass restore and data resiliency. So when the first backup comes in, it's a full copy. When we pull in the next copy, it's incremental. And instead of storing the incremental separately as a file, we clone the first copy of the backup instantly, and we apply the incremental right where it, it needs to go. Similarly, for the second incremental, we can clone the first copy with the first incremental, and we can apply the second incremental right where it has to go. Because of this, we now have, uh, let's say if these are VMs, we have several VMs and each of which have several copies that are fully hydrated. And now we can do an instant mass restore by exposing them via the protocols, and then they can be uh, moved back to the primary in the background. We talked about low RTO and how 
we can uh, keep everything fully hydrated, and that's possible by our instant clone technology. Let's look at how the SnapTree instant clone technology works. I want to first compare it with traditional clones. If you take traditional clones, let's say there is a file S0, which has three blocks, A, B, and C. Then when the clone S1 uh, is cloned from S0, and let's say only block C is modified, and then S2 is cloned from S1, and again, only block C is modified, and so on. Now the last clone, Sn, uh, has its own copy of block C, but then it says that for other things, I'm referring to my previous clone, and so on. So when you try to access block C, it, uh, it, you can access it pretty fast because it just has a copy of block C. But then let's say you want to access block A or block B. When you try to read that, SN will say that, oh, I'm referring to SN minus 1, and so on. And finally, it will get to S0, and then it will read the block B. So as this chain gets longer and longer, the reads become slower. But with SnapTree, the data is organized, the blocks are organized in the form of a B plus tree. So S0 points to A via some intermediate nodes, and it also points to C via some intermediate nodes. When clone S1 uh, is cloned from S0, and let's say block C is overwritten, it writes its own copy uh, block C, but then for other block A and block B, it refers to the original A and B via the intermediate nodes. So if you look at it, the height of this tree is same as the height of the tree S1. So because, Ganesh, if, if block B is modified, then it has to be... So then it'll it shadow has to copy... It be linked from whatever the snap version of it where the block B was modified. Right, so when block B is modified, like let's take block C. Block C was modified, and hence it sort of creates a path and it keeps its own block C. But as block A and block B were not modified, so it points via the intermediate nodes to the original block A and B. So let's say S0 decides to modify block B. Then it huh? creates a new block B for itself, call it B1, and everybody else is still pointing to B. Is that how yes. it works? Yes. I have a question. You talk about the, the words traditional clone up there, and I see how you're saying that mm -hmm. that's a traditional clone. Can you give me an example, I mean, of another vendor that would <clears> fit that? Because <throat> I'm trying to think of one. Like VMware clones, for example, work yeah, this way. VMware Snap. Wow. Yeah. I don't know anybody who uses those. But uh, I mean, a lot of storage actually uses this because this is the traditional way you clone it. You make a clone and you point it to the previous clone. I'm talking about chain clones. I mean, yeah, I can see that with VMware, but I'm talking from a storage perspective. I'm not, I'm trying. Yeah, NetApp don't do that, for example. They does not. Yeah. They don't do that. But NetApp's clones are not distributed. Um, we can. Oh I no, no, I'm not worried about the distributed. I'm just talking about you said coming from a clone perspective, from a chain perspective, where I'm always linking to the last clone. That's my only point. That's my only question. EMC Unity don't, don't do that either. Right, they all go to the original, correct? Yeah. So I think maybe, maybe it's just VMware that yeah. does it, right? Yeah, it's more application level. Okay. Snap. Yeah. We can talk about names um, outside of this talk. <laughs> <laughs> so effectively, you're keeping a manifest in each of the clones to describe its blocks. And as long as those blocks don't change significantly from one snap to another, you're, you're fine. Right, and if it changes, then it'll just make its own copy. And then, so the basic point is because of this tree-like structure, the cost to access block A via from S0 or S1 is the same. So now you can have large number of these clones, and then there is no read slowdown. Mm -hmm. So how do you determine the, the incremental aspect of a, of a backup in, in real time? So I mean, you're getting uh, a backup fee, which is a full backup again, right? So when you get the increment, like we use, let's say for VMware, you can use VADP to get the incremental blocks, and then you can apply them. Just to the change blocks. Yeah, yeah. just to yeah. change blocks. I mean, that probably adds very minute improvement unless you've got chains going up like 2,000 snapshots. With your main use case being secondary storage rather than primary storage, storage is that really that important? A lot of snapshots in secondary. It, it is. Like, a lot, you would yeah. think. Secondary, yeah, but it's secondary you can have that, more, though. Is the performance that important in a secondary storage? If, if, well. you're, if, if you want to keep, uh, if you want to take backups frequently, then it's very important. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you'll be limited to taking backups only once a night, which is what traditional vendors do. And that the reason for that is that if they try to take too many backups, they really get slowed down. But the taking the backup itself is only a metadata operation, so that doesn't really get affected by that. I mean, the benefit of that is when it comes to reading stuff, so you don't have to traverse the snap, snap, snapshot chain. Uh -huh. So then when you try to recover, 
now you are very slow. Your recovery has become very slow. Right. So now, now you give so, me the answer. So it's the recovery. That's so that. I, you do, you got to if you don't have snap trees, you got to compromise somewhere. Yeah. So you can compromise uh, by taking uh, you know very fast snapshots, but your recoveries will become very slow. Right. If you don't want your recoveries to be slow, then you have to break these chains, and you have to do a lot of copying in the background. Right. Now that, then, that makes sense. That's right. right. So then one last question on, the, on your picture. I just want to make sure I understand it because uh, it looks like mm -hmm. from the diagram on the bottom, it looks like that somehow you knew that A and B were going to be different than C before you made the clones, which is obviously not the case. So, but am I correct in assuming like when I make a clone, what the clone is basically is basically just copying a, the root, I could call it inode, exactly. uh, root metadata of that file, and so it's just making it's just pointing to its own copy of that metadata of the tree of data that's going on, so that you know as it makes its own independent changes, it'll make its own change somewhere else. Right. And, so it'll just all right. yeah, all right. clone that's the right. root, and then it'll point to the children of the original tree. So in other words, you've kind of moved the overhead onto the front end rather than the back end. No, no, not really. No. Uh, so imagine, imagine that you take a snapshot S1. All you have done is pointed to the children of S0. That's it. And since there are a limited number of children, that operation is very, very fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. It's, fun. it's easy to understand. Mm -hmm. So the next thing I want to talk about is strict consistency. As Mohit mentioned, SpanFS is designed for strict consistency. So. Um, this is especially important in a scale-out system. In in a lot of scale-out systems, um, it only provides eventual consistency. And what we mean by that is, let's say the user writes a block. Now the acknowledgment is sent before all the data and metadata associated with the blocks is propagated throughout the cluster. So now the problem with that is, if the user writes a block, and there is a failure immediately, and let's say some part of metadata or data is not propagated, then, and let's say this node fails, when the user goes to another node and look for the data, uh, remember this data has already been acknowledged, now the client will not find the data. This is a data corruption, and it's a pretty serious issue. But with Coercity, what happens is that every time a block of data is written, all the data and metadata associated with that is propagated throughout the cluster, and only then we would acknowledge the right. And uh, this is pretty tricky because we have to do this for every single thing. If you have a data journal, then the data journal has to be distributed. If you have any piece um, that deals with either data or metadata, it needs to be strictly consistent. And we guarantee this. Because of this, even if the user writes the data and there is a failure, when we don't acknowledge to the user, then it'll be as if the, the right never happened. Or when we acknowledge to the user, then uh, everything associated with that I.O. is fully propagated through the cluster. What's your internode uh, bandwidth? Uh, we use 10G links, or we, uh, we can use 1G links. But yeah, we recommend 10G links between the two. And when you're, you have this data continuum where you've got data in the cloud and oh. data on premise, then you're not using that sort of so you're not you're not replicating the data before you to the cloud before you respond to so the, right now we have asynchronous replication so to the cloud yeah. yeah okay so so cloud is being used in multiple forms it's archival is different right you're, that's completely asynchronous but if you are tearing to the cloud um, tearing is a background operation so uh, you you kind of in the background the data has become cold it's not being live accessed uh, you move to the cloud we're not talking about a hybrid system at some point where you have Nodes on premise, on premises, and then I almost did it, and uh, <laughs> and some and some up in the cloud where they're, they're like a stretched cluster. We're not doing that today, correct? Not today, but okay. good in the works. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so, real quick introduction because I needed to say something earlier. Um, Aaron Delp, I, I lead tech solutions here at Cohesity, um, but uh, it is week two. So I, I am not speaking uh, at this particular event, but I just wanted to share very quickly um, a little bit about why I joined. Um, there's, of course, the technology that you've seen here, but the, this last one here, this, uh, this cloud and apps and integration is what we're really gonna be emphasizing in the next two sections today. And, and it's really about how do we unlock that dark data? How do we take everything that has been uh, protect it on this system, on this data platform, and then unlock all of those other systems. How do we use this for test dev? How do we use this in a multi-protocol situation? And how do we kind of achieve that vision of, of cloud 
uh, and really cohesity anywhere. And so with that, we're going to have Gaurav come up and uh, tell us about multi-protocol and object stores.